This young man is a guinea pig in a medical research experiment. He has offered his healthy body as a testing ground for research. And this man is helping to build a better world. This young man is doing research in agronomy. And this man has dedicated his life to the well-being of his fellow men. This young American has been overseas for two years because of his conviction that understanding between people is essential to peace between nations. I'm Don Murray. These men share a conviction with me that war is never the answer to a problem. Because of this conviction, we do not bear arms. Instead, we meet the problem by seeking constructive alternatives to war. We are called pacifists or conscientious objectors. But our concern is really much more than in just objecting to participation in war. We would like to find a way in which all men could solve their problems and build a peaceful world without resorting to violence and to war. This is the story of some of the ways in which we conscientious objectors express our convictions. fear that afflicts human beings, the fear of the unknown. It starts in children who see all kinds of imagined horrors out in the dark. And it continues on into adult life, so that it seems almost a part of human nature to be fearful of people we do not know, to suspect actions we do not understand. Most of us find it easier to misinterpret the actions of a minority group than try to understand them. And the smaller the group in question, the more intense this problem of understanding, of failure to communicate. Conscientious objectors to war, or pacifists, are a small group of whom most of us know relatively little. And what we do know is usually riddled with half-truths and colored by misinformation and rumor. Many Americans take it for granted that pacifists are yellow, cowards, slackers. <laughs> Others are quite sure that pacifists are crackpots, irresponsible, poor citizens equipped with unstable personalities and fuzzy intellects. Still others concede that pacifists may be well-meaning, but insist that they are impractical visionaries who do not understand the demands made upon practical men in a real world. Relatively few Americans know what happens to conscientious objectors of draft age. Some people assume they are in the Army Medical Corps or in concentration camps behind barbed wires or in jail. Many think they are all Quakers. These are all misleading generalizations. Let's try to see what the facts really are. To begin with, conscientious objectors to war are very much like anybody else you may know. Average people who might come from any representative cross-section of the United States. Farmers and factory workers, lawyers and laborers, scientists and students, ordinary people, all of them, all the way from A for actor to Z for zoologist. People just like you, your friends and neighbors and family. And just like you and your friends, conscientious objectors take pride in their independence of thought and freedom of action. 
even though their viewpoints sometimes subject them to misunderstanding and discomfort. The fact that they are individual thinkers is clear from the difference in attitudes among CEOs themselves when faced with conscription. One large group of conscientious objectors, for instance, is quite prepared to enter the armed services along with thousands of other young Americans of draft age. However, because they live according to a way of life that does not permit them to bear arms or to take the lives of the enemy in combat, even in self-defense, Congress made provision in the Selective Service Act for this group to do non-combatant service. So, when they enter the armed forces, these men usually serve in the medical corps, in which capacity many have been in battle as medics and corpsmen. Most COs, however, find that their convictions not only do not permit them to bear arms or take a human life, but will not allow them to serve in any branch of the military forces. Here, too, Congress has recognized the sincerity of this position and has provided for it. The men in this group must fill out the general classification questionnaire, and then if the board grants them CO status, they must enter into a period of alternative service at least as long as the period they would serve if they had been inducted into the armed forces. During this period, they must serve at work that Congress has defined as, quote, civilian work contributing to the maintenance of national health, safety, or interest. There is still a third group of COs whose pacifist way of life does not permit them to accept either of these alternatives. They cannot agree to assignment either to non-combatant work in armed forces or to civilian work of national importance. These men object on conscientious or religious grounds to the basic nature of any conscription law, sometimes even to the point where they refuse to register or comply in any way with the various selective service regulations. Men who take this non-registrant position are not draft dodgers or evaders. The non-registrant makes his position clear to his draft board and to the government and he makes no effort to conceal his whereabouts. He knows quite well that he is violating the law and what the consequences are likely to be. The convictions of the men in this group of pacifists are most difficult of all for their fellow Americans to understand or to appreciate. And yet, although the men in these three groups of pacifists draw the line of conscientious objection at different points, the underlying principles that motivate their actions are basically the same. Whether a CO is a non-combatant soldier, a civilian doing work of national importance, or a non-registrant, he bases his stand upon a deep-seated set of convictions. Convictions that motivate not only the single act of non-conformity or objection which leads him to differ with his fellow citizens, but that also motivate all positive aspects of his life. He feels that the principles of service to his fellow men, of understanding and tolerance, and of cooperation with people of different convictions, must find expression in his daily living and must be the guiding factor in all human relationships. In a time of war or conscription, therefore, the pacifist finds himself having to go a different way from most of his fellow citizens, perhaps even to face the difficult choice of obeying the laws of his country or of following what he understands to be the leading of a higher authority. In such a situation, he feels that there is, for him, really only one possibility. He must follow the dictates of his conscience, even if this does, in fact, conflict with the general viewpoints of his fellow Americans. Congress has made legal provision for religious conscientious objection. This provision has been interpreted broadly to include persons whose convictions would probably not be classified traditionally as religious. During World War II, conscientious objectors came from 230 different religious groups, including substantial numbers from all the major religious faiths and denominations. 
more than 60 religious bodies of all denominations have published statements claiming the right of conscientious objector status for those of their members who take this stand. Congress has long recognized that a man may be a sincere conscientious objector, whether he is a Catholic, a Protestant, or a Jew. He may not even belong to a formal religious body or institution and still be entitled to recognition under the draft law. This recognition by Congress and by the clergy and membership of the various denominations is not due to their agreement with a specific stand taken by conscientious objectors, since obviously many of them do not agree with the pacifist position, nor do they claim such status for themselves. It is rather an extension and a continuation of the basic American tradition of religious freedom. It was the same principle which brought the earliest settlers across the Atlantic to the shores of a colonial wilderness. Of course, there are conscientious objectives in other countries too, but this tradition of religious freedom is woven into the very fabric of our legal structure, our government, our culture, and our viewpoint of freedom for the individual. And it is this same tradition of religious freedom which has given legal standing to the CO in the eyes of his government, his church, and his fellow citizens today. Mere church affiliation is not sufficient to establish a man's claim to status as a conscientious objector with the right to engage in alternative service. There is a very carefully defined procedure which must be followed and specific forms which must be filled out in a certain sequence and in a rigidly specified period of time. In every case, conscientious objective status must be established on an individual basis rather than on the basis of church affiliation. Most religious organizations have therefore established a formal counseling service to assist the young draftee in following the proper procedure and in addition, many churches have cooperated in the formation of a national joint counseling service. Such counseling is essential because it has been found from a practical standpoint that sincere COs who find their way into armed forces by mistake or by failing to follow the proper procedure to establish CO status almost invariably pose a serious problem both for the CO and for the military unit to which he is assigned. On the other hand, if the CO is willing to register and observe the Selective Service regulations as they apply to him, and if he cannot accept non-combatant service in the armed forces, by following the proper procedure and furnishing the necessary forms, affidavits, and questionnaires, he should be able to establish his position as a conscientious objector. He then becomes eligible for alternative service. He may volunteer for such work with one of the agencies approved by the Director of Selective Service, or he may be assigned by his local draft board to a project approved by the State Director of Selective Service. In either case, he will serve for the same length of time as he would have had he been inducted into the armed services, normally two years. The kind of work he will do during this period varies enormously, but depends principally upon two factors. First, the opportunities which are open, and second, the individual qualifications which he must have to perform such work. If his draft board assigns him to a project, the alternative service worker is paid the prevailing wage for such work, usually a modest amount, since most projects that are approved are short of workers in the lower wage brackets. If the man volunteers for unsalaried service with one of the voluntary service agencies, and if his abilities qualify him for one of the openings that are available, he will receive maintenance and a small personal allowance, as such service is in the nature of a voluntary contribution of time and talent. Some approved service agencies also pay the prevailing wage rates, but even in these cases, the sum is a modest amount. Although the kind of civilian work done by alternative service workers depends upon conditions, need, and finances available to support such projects, the jobs have tended, in general, to fall into one of the following five categories. Hospitals, both general hospitals and mental hospitals, experimental research units, agricultural work, 
welfare projects and programs, and service overseas in relief, education, and rehabilitation work. COs first started working in mental hospitals during World War II, when there was a very drastic shortage of personnel, both trained and untrained. After the war, need for personnel in mental hospitals continued. Furthermore, administrators of mental hospitals found the CEOs to be well suited to the newer techniques of treatment. For religious pacifists are motivated to practice in all their relationships the gentler virtues of love, patience, and forbearance. Many general hospitals have been approved for alternative service assignments. And in these situations also, sincere pacifists have found ample opportunity to demonstrate their devotion to the ideal of service to their fellow man. During the Second World War, some SEALs volunteered to serve as guinea pigs in various medical experimental units. And after the war, this kind of experimental work continued in many hospitals and research centers. SEALs have continued to serve as human guinea pigs, as normal control patients, and, when properly qualified, as technicians in this kind of work so essential to medical research and progress. Many alternative service workers with agricultural backgrounds have been assigned to farms and agricultural research work, especially in the field of dairy herd improvement and testing. And other men who have the necessary training and technical qualifications have been assigned to agricultural research work in federal and state experimental stations. During the last few years, alternative service workers have been assigned to welfare programs and projects both private and public. Some typical examples of these are conducting schools and doing social work in migrant work camps in those areas where migrant laborers take their families and follow the sun to do the planting, cultivating, and harvesting of farm crops. Alternative service workers have also helped to redevelop blighted city areas, working as manual laborers side by side with slum dwellers in the daytime, and in the evening, conducting recreational programs for the children and study programs for the adults, helping to improve the condition of places and people together in a coordinated kind of rehabilitation in the worst slum areas of the largest cities. In the southwest, many miles from the nearest paved roads, COs have been volunteering to work on the reservations with the first Americans, the Indians, whose health conditions, economic hardships, and educational facilities are sometimes among the worst in the country. Alternative service workers with special qualifications as doctors, teachers, and trained social workers live side by side with the Indians, bringing their professional talents to bear on the serious problems faced by these proud people. COs also work overseas, motivated by a desire to help the people of foreign lands to solve their post-war problems and raise their living standards. Alternative service workers with the necessary qualifications have volunteered to do reconstruction and rehabilitation work in some 40 countries throughout the world. Sometimes the project is one of village rehabilitation. Other times, building homes for homeless refugees and stateless persons. Teaching a Greek farmer a better way to rotate his crops. Building and operating a hospital in the mountains of Latin America. Working in an orphanage in Italy. Helping to drain a malaria swamp in Pakistan teaching a new trade to a Chinese refugee in Hong Kong. In this country or overseas, in city, in village, or open field, the American alternative service worker is living a dynamic life of quiet witness, a life of significant service to others, which follows naturally from the conviction that motivates him, the conviction that love and understanding and labor and suffering shared with others will bring all men together in peace and friendship instead of war. I grew up in a peace church and my dad was a conscientious objector in the First World War so of course I've done a great deal of thinking about pacifism. By the time I was drafted 
My Christian convictions were pretty clear. I went into alternative service. I'm a farm boy, and I know this agricultural research will eventually mean more food in a world where lots of people are still hungry. That strikes me as the kind of thing the Lord would want me to be doing, helping all men in a positive way. Mental hospital patients live in an unreal world, a world shadowed by their fears. The service I am doing is not an interruption in my life, but a part of it. Helping people to overcome their fears and to cope with their real life problems. Bringing Christ's healing where there is hurt. His love where there is fear. This is how I want to spend my life. Sometimes it seems as well as if everybody is tearing things down. Hate and violence and war. I've had enough. The strength I have, I want to use to build a world, not tear it down. If we're ever to have a peaceful world, we have to make brotherhood mean something, and something more than just a slogan. We have to make brotherhood real. Here in India, working alongside village people, I feel that I'm doing more than sharing my skills. Because in learning to know and respect other men and their ways of life, I've rediscovered in a new kind of way something I've always believed, that every person has something of God in him. And I, I find also that when people learn to work with each other, even if it's, if it's only trying new seed or poultry stock, they accept each other as friends. These people are my friends now, and I am theirs. The experiment involves a continuous cross-circulation of blood between myself, a normal control patient, and a rather severely schizophrenic patient. I am not in a position to see the schizophrenic patient. I'm sure that this is intentional so that I'll not be unduly alarmed if, uh, if he should have some rather violent contortions. The doctors also strapped down my arms, primarily they say so that the needle won't be dislodged. I think this is also uh, in order that I won't be, uh, that I won't flip myself onto the floor uh, if I should have a convulsion. I was brought up primarily in the Lutheran Church. I didn't receive any specifically pacifist training there, but I developed a powerfully moving Christian faith, though I only realized its implications for the pacifist position about five or six years ago. And I realized that one's faith must be socially significant. The motivations of pacifists lead them into many different roads. And the pacifist believes that any one of these alternatives is a likely road, a constructive road to peace.